Heavenly Father, we come to a close of this series. and We ask that you would finish um, the thoughts, the themes that we've been developing in a consistent, logical way and empower them according to your will. We thank you for being with us for these days that we've been putting this together. We ask that you would send your spirit and angels again to be here and attend in this meeting and let the words be for your glory and, glory and honor, truthful, honest, and open our hearts and minds to understand these things. We certainly don't deserve to be among those that are understanding and hearing these wonderful truths here at the end of the world. And we're amazed that you've allowed us to be among those that are hearing these things and called us here. And all we can do is thank you and ask that you would uh, somehow uh, raise us up from uh, the, the dust of humility to be uh, someone that can share these things with those around us that aren't recognizing what's taking place in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, this is the conclusion of about probably two months of anxiety on my part, hopefully not sinful anxiety. When, when we did Boise a couple months ago, uh, about that time we came under the conviction that we needed to do this series, uh, which meant you had to develop all the notes, put them into PowerPoint for the video production, see if the Lord opened a door to a place where we could record it. And it's, <laughs> it's amazing that for myself, it's a personal testimony <laughs> that we're here at the last presentation. So for those of you that uh, haven't been through all of them, of course, we've been emphasizing the foundational truths that were set forth by God. On this 1843 chart, that's what Sister White says, the 1843 chart, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. And none of the figures could be changed. And we've went through more than once the relationship of the seven and three European kings, the three that had to be removed to place the papacy. We've, been, we've looked at the relationship of pagan Rome and papal Rome. We've looked at the 1335 and the 1290 of Daniel 12. Uh, we've looked at the 2520, the 2300. Uh, the only thing that we haven't taken up yet is the seven trumpets. And in Adventism today, there are people that, that are erroneous from two ways, two directions. Um, number one, some people say the pioneers were wrong on the seven trumpets. And therefore, what we have to say about the seven trumpets is correct. Some people say the pioneers are correct about the trumpets, but there is a secondary fulfillment at the end of the world. And I would submit this to you. You're going to be faithful to inspiration. We've read it more than once in this presentation. Sister White says, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and none of the figures should be altered. Therefore, the first argument, pioneers were not wrong on the trumpets. They have the trumpets illustrated here. The Lord endorsed their position on the trumpets. Now, there's another argument. The second one I said is that, well, the pioneers were right, but this is a secondary application. And brothers and sisters, there's an understanding of prophecy that doesn't allow that to be possible. Prophecy and history repeat. Sister White says that over and over again. Jesus taught it in Matthew 24. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 24 was a fulfillment of prophecy. It was also history. And Sister White, in a great controversy, very plainly says that will be repeated at the end of the world. So prophecy and history repeat. But in order for a prophetic history to be repeated... It has to finish. And the seven trumpets are not finished. We're living in the time period of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And before the seven trumpets can be repeated, they have to conclude. They haven't concluded yet. So it can't be that the pioneers were correct, but there's a secondary application. All it can be is that the seven trumpets are now reaching their conclusion. Of course, the pioneers believed the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22nd, 1844, and they were correct. Um, so what does this have to do with present truth? Revelation 18, verse 2 says this. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, 
and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> and we've looked at more than once in this presentation that in Daniel 11, verse 14, the robbers of thy people are Rome. And in Daniel 11, verse 14, it says, the robbers of thy people establish the vision. Rome establishes the vision. And the vision is the vision of prophecy at the end of the world. The, the prophetic testimony at the end of the world is established by Rome. And when you look closely at Rome as a prophetic symbol, you'll find a variety of ways that Rome breaks down in a threefold fashion. So we've read the quote where Sister White says, the book by Uriah Smith, Daniel and Revelation, is God's helping hand, and no other book can do the work that this book can do. Go look at what Uriah Smith says about the seven trumpets of Revelation. And you'll find that in the seven trumpets of Revelation, over and over again, one of the, the prophetic keys in that passage of those trumpets is a third of the trees, a third of the seas, a third of this, a third of that. And as the pioneers related to these prophetic symbols being divided into three, they had very specific understandings for them. Rome is divisible by three. Eastern Rome, when Rome was divided between an east and west in the year 330, the pioneers teach that Eastern Rome was divided in three because Constantine at that time divided the kingdom, the geographical kingdom, into three parts. He gave it to his three sons. I never can remember their names because they're so much alike. Constance, Constantinus, and Constantine II, possibly, but they're that close together. But nevertheless, he divided the kingdom into three. That was Eastern Rome. Western Rome was divided into three. How was Western Rome divided into three? The thing that was significant in the history of Western Rome is that's where government was invented. And the government that was invented there in Western Rome was a three-part government. And when the trumpets are talking about the threefold division of Western Rome, they identify uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun being the, the head of the government, the Caesar, the, the stars being the Senate, and the moon being the triumphant, the, the judicial branch. So the, what I'm, all I'm saying here is that when it comes to Rome and Bible prophecy, there are a variety of ways that prophecy emphasizes that Rome, the, a number associated with Rome, is three. How many parts is modern Rome, modern Babylon, divided into? Three, the beast, the dragon, the false prophet. So when it comes to Rome in Bible prophecy, Rome establishes the vision, and there is a rule that is, can be recognized in the Bible that's associated with Rome. Let me back up one step further. When Sister White says that the Millerite time period is going to be repeated to the very letter, we have a book, um, and I'm not trying to sell anything on Sabbath, but we still have some book, some of these copies. And it's the classic. Every Seventh-day Adventist that's serious about the end of the world should have this book, even though it's written by a theolo theologian, it's a little bit difficult. Um, to wade through. It's, it's worth the wade. If you, if you have to read it two or three times, you're going to come away from it understanding the, uh, the best presentation of the history of the Millerites that you're going to find. And uh, it's called The Theological Foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission by Dam Steet. And uh, in that time period, one of the things that was part of the Millerite history, and sometimes I think this may be a little bit hard for us to accept, but it's there, is that the Lord used William Miller to, to put together a group of rules of Bible prophecy. And brothers and sisters, as you read that book, it, it talks about the history before the Millerite time period, during the Millerite time period, and immediately after the Great Disappointment. And, and we all know that William Miller went astray after 1844, right? He started making some wrong decisions. As according to the spirit of prophecy, he's a saved man. But he didn't continue on in the development of truth. And those pioneers that did continue on in the development of truth, as they began to interact with Miller as he was going into darkness, you know what they used against Miller to show that he was going into darkness? The rules of Bible prophecy developed by William Miller. All the Millerites referred to those rules as standard operating procedure. They were established by the Lord as rules necessary to identify the present truth message for that time period. And therefore, I suggest to you, when this history is repeated again at the end of the world, it's not out of character with the repeat of history to expect that there will be certain rules 
that are recognized once again as important at that particular time period in identifying the message for that particular time period. And I would suggest to you that one of these rules has to do with Rome establishing the vision, and it's called a triple application of prophecy. There is a rule established in the teens. You can find in the teens verses that teach this rule, and it's upon the testimony of two a thing is established. The Bible says that over and over again. So when you take that rule, upon the testimony of two a thing is established, you find that there are certain prophecies in the Bible that are repeated three times. Ah, there's a number associated with Rome. And that those particular prophecies have their own internal rules within themselves. And what the rule are, what the rule is, is that when you take the first time that prophecy is fulfilled and you take the characteristics associated with that first fulfillment of prophecy and you combine it with the characteristics of the second time that prophecy is fulfilled, those two together, upon the testimony of two things established, they establish and identify the third fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And when it comes to what we just read, Revelation 18, verse 2, when it says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that's a triple application of prophecy. This is our message. Revelation 18, this is what we've been raised up to proclaim is the fourth angel's message. And in this message, what it's telling us is if I'm going to clarify the fall of modern Babylon, when Nimrod's Babylon fell, if I take those characteristics and I combine it with Babylon that fell in Belshazzar, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, I have defined the modern fall of Babylon. So right in the very message that we understand to be our message, you can see this rule symbolically represented. And you can see here um, on your, your syllabus, page 170, some of the, the, the things that I've just suggested. Let me show you another triple application of prophecy. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not saying that I went through and outlined the different characteristics of both falls of Babylon. I'm just trying to set this principle out in a very simple fashion. We have dealt with this in the prophecy school, which is available more in depth. But um, for this presentation, and for those of you that may be new to this, uh, we'll do a brief illustration of it. And it's another evidence that it's truth, brothers and sisters, is how simple this is to see. Another triple application of prophecy, the three Elijahs. Elijah the first. This is Elijah the first had to deal with a threefold enemy. Brothers and sisters, we're the ones that are to clarify modern Babylon at the end of the world. And Revelation 16 says modern Babylon comes in three parts, the beast, the dragon, the false prophet. Elijah the first had to deal with Jezebel, an impure woman, Ahab, a civil power, and the prophets of Baal, a power that did the dance of deception. You can see the references here for that story. Elijah the second, John the Baptist, had to deal with uh, an impure woman, an impure church, Herodias, a civil power, Herod, and Salome did the dance of deception. That, those characteristics, I mean, this is really simplified. We can look in detail at these characteristics. But this is a triple application of prophecy. The first Elijah has to deal with a threefold power, a corrupt church, Jezebel a civil power, a king, Ahab, and a deceiving power that does a dance. John the Baptist, the second Elijah, Herodias, impure woman, impure church, Herod, civil power, Salome, dance of deception. Elijah the third, that's you and I. That's you and I. The papacy, impure woman, comes into a church-state relationship with the United Nations, a worldwide civil power. And the reason it happens is because according to Revelation 13, verses 13 and onward, the United States deceives them into the, to, to that arrangement, the dance of deception. Very simple. Our message, if you read this book that we just mentioned about the, the foundations of Adventism, it points out very specifically, brothers and sisters, that after the great disappointment, those people, the little flock that followed the truth, they had to come to grips with who and what they were. I mean, they'd been telling the world something that was totally wrong. But they knew that they'd been led by the Lord. 
So they had, to, they had to go back into God's word and figure out what went wrong and who they really were. And they begin to justify their understanding and their current position from passages in the Bible. And you know what the first thing they came to understand who they were? The first thing before the disappointment is they understood they were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins. But after the great disappointment, you know what the first thing they understood they were? They were the Elijah people. You brothers and sisters, they, this, is, this is a foundational understanding of Adventism, this story of Elijah. And we've known it through the 150 years. You've, you've heard Adventists for 150 years. I mean, they've done it, and we haven't heard them. But it's common in Adventism to make a comparison with, of Adventism with Elijah. We, we are the ones that proclaim the Elijah message. And sure enough, Elijah the first represents God's people that do not taste death. John the Baptist, those who get laid to rest, that deal with the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet at the end of the world. This is a triple application of prophecy. It has a connection with Rome because it gives us the characteristics of what modern Rome is. Modern Rome is a corrupt church that comes into a church-state relation with a world civil power that is being, the world is being forced to accept this impure marriage by the United States, the false prophet. So, you see those things reflected on your uh, notes. You can look at that later. Um, there was a brother in here yesterday, and uh, he said that uh, he wanted to hear this one quote, and I have it. So let, I'll, I'll take a little bit more time with this, with this Elijah. I was going to pass over it. But I want him to hear this quote. Um, the prophets of Baal danced around the, their offering all day long. Salome did a dance of deception. And Revelation 13 says the United States is going to deceive the world. Ahab, Herod, civil power, both kings. What's a king in Bible prophecy? A kingdom, civil power, geopolitical power, impure woman, easy to see. Uh, their marriage, their unlawful marriage in both cases, pro prophetically looking for symbolic application, combination of churches, church and state. Um, the message that causes the persecution is that um, Elijah the first told Ahab, you're the one that's the troubler of Israel. John the Baptist, what did he tell Herod? You're not supposed to be married to your brother's wife. But there's a, there's a, a message that enrages the papacy, and that's Daniel 11, verse 44. It says there's tidings that comes out of the east and the north that enrages the papacy, and he, uh, he goes forth to utterly destroy and make away many. Well, that message is, is that God's people are going to point to Ahab and say, you're the troubler because you weren't supposed to come into a church-state relationship with the papacy. Or they're going to point to Herod and say, you're not supposed to be in a church-state relationship with your brother's wife. It's, it's the message. It's the message of prophecy. Um, in both cases, Jezebel at Carmel. Was Jezebel in the story of Carmel? Was she there? No, nope, she's behind the scenes. She was back in Samaria. In, the, in Herod's birthday party when Salome did the dance, was Herodias there? Nope. The, the impure church is behind the scenes pulling the strings. And, you know, we had a better not go there about our conversation about some of the presidents recently here at lunch. But, brothers and sisters, it's obvious that the papacy has been pulling the string it, with the presidents of the United States, at least from Ronald Reagan, I think before, but at least from there, the papacy's been behind the scenes pulling the strings. See? So that, and that's an agreement with Bible prophecy. That's not just some idle speculation. Bible prophecy says it's so. Um, next page. The whole issue is that this woman, what does she want to do? She wants to persecute. She wants to kill Elijah. She's going to chop off John the Baptist's head. Even if no one understands it. Ahab didn't understand that Jezebel had this hatred for Elijah. When, when Ahab went to Jezebel, he told her about the victory in Carmel, and he thought she was going to be, become converted. And she says, by this time tomorrow, he's a dead man. Herod didn't think Salome was going to say, when he says, up to my, half my kingdom I'll give you, you think he was thinking she was going to come up and say, well, I don't want half your kingdom. I just want John the Baptist's head in a charger. See, they, this is a deception going on about the papacy. He wants to kill Elijah and John the Baptist. Who's Elijah and John the Baptist? It's you and I. It's you and I. Right? Isn't that how you understand it? The whole intent is death. It's a public event. Mount Carmel, Herod's birthday. The whole world's going to see this. That's why when you look at the 3-1 combination, we mentioned that earlier. When you look at the different 3-1 combinations in Bible prophecy, 
you know, I asked a brother here this afternoon who's a, a very good health reformer. He says, where can you show that the third angel's message is the right arm, or where the, that the health message is the right arm of the third angel's message from the Bible? He says, well, I don't know. You know where you can show it? In the 3-1 combination. Everywhere you find the 3-1 combination symbolized in the Bible, it's teaching a lesson about Adventism. And in chapter 1 of Daniel, the very first thing about Daniel's prophetic testimony is chapter 1 about the health message, and Daniel and his three friends were there representing that the health message is the strength, the right arm of the third angel's message. So when you go through Bible prophecy and you begin to, to see that each one of these three one combinations represents a different aspect of Adventism, then you ask yourself, what's being taught in Daniel chapter 3? Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego coming to the test of Nebuchadnezzar's image, which there's at least 11 places, different places where Sister White says that's a Sunday law. And they get thrown into the flaming, fiery furnace, and a fourth appears. What's the lesson there? The lesson there is, the way that the fourth angel's message gets carried to the world is the whole world's going to watch Seventh-day Adventists go into the furnace fire of affliction because the whole world was represented there at that test. All the kings and governors and rulers are watching there. Brothers and sisters, this is going to be a public event. It's going to be Herod's birthday. It's going to be done in Carmel. The whole world's going to watch what happens to Seventh-day Adventists in the very near future. The civil power is deceived. Ahab didn't expect Jezebel's reaction. Herod didn't expect Salome's answer. And brothers and sisters, when you put that together and you've identified the United Nations as the civil power and the papacy as the impure woman and the United States as the deceiving power and you go back into the Iraq war, you see that when they captured Saddam Hussein, there was an argument that went on in the world and the argument was this. Do we try Saddam Hussein in the United States or in Iraq or do we try, them, try him in a world court? The Europeans, the United Nations said we want to try him in the world court because the world court doesn't believe in the death penalty. But Iraq and the United States says, let's try him either in Iraq or the United States because we believe in the death penalty. And during that argument, if you paid close attention, the papacy come out and it got into the argument. And what did the papacy say? The papacy says, we agree with the United Nations. We don't believe in the death penalty. Does papacy believe in the death penalty? See, right now the world's being prepared to think that the papacy don't believe in the death penalty. And when radical Islam finally forces the world to accept the arrangement of the United Nations with the papacy sitting on top of the United Nations, they're going to find out that the papacy does believe in the death penalty and that the papacy really isn't worried about Islam. That's the other part of the decision, deception. They're worried about you and I. And everybody's going to be surprised. But according to Maranatha, I think it's page 199, there's going to be many martyrs. So there's a deception going on. It's going on in the world today if you care to see it. If, you care to, if we care to shake off our Laodicean blinders and look around, the story of Elijah is happening right now. It's happening. Okay, uh, so the one that does the dance of deception, Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14, when it's talking about the United States deceiving the whole world, in verse 13, it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down, out of, down from heaven on earth inside of men. Where does John get that terminology? From Mount Carmel. Saying, if you're going to understand how the United States deceives the world, then you need to understand it in the context of Elijah. That's the deceiving power. That's the prophets of Baal doing their dance. That's Salome doing their dance. Brothers and sisters, how does the United States deceive the world according to Revelation 13? The United States is the power in Bible prophecy that changes. Each of the powers in Bible prophecy have different characteristics unto themselves. Rome, the papacy, never changes. But the United States, it changes. It begins as a lamb, ends up speaking as a dragon. It begins with two horns. It ends with two horns. When the United States begins, the two horns of strength are republicanism and Protestantism. But when the United States is forcing the world to worship the beast of Catholicism, it's not upholding republicanism or Protestantism, is it? So what are the two horns of strength for the United States at the end of the world? Well, chapter 13 tells you. The United States is going to tell the world, if you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. Economic strength. You don't have the mark of the beast, you're put to death. Military strength. The two horns of strength for the United States at the end, the two things that the United States uses to deceive the world is military and economic strength. If you ever reach a period in time where you see the United States starting to go out to the world and tell countries what they need to do 
And if those countries don't respond, they throw an economic boycott on them. And then if the countries still don't do what they want, they invade them with their military. If you ever reach that time, you know that the prophets of Baal are dancing. You know that Salome is dancing. You seen that going on in the world lately? Brothers and sisters, it's been going on for 20 years. Over 20 years. So, here's the quote that I wanted to share with the brother. He says, I want to see this. I shared it with him yesterday. The kings, the civil authorities. Great controversy, page 439, speaking of the dragon in chapter 12. Sister White says this, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. So when it comes to the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet of Revelation 16, we need to understand that, yes, primarily the dragon is Satan, but the dragon throughout history has used earthly kingdoms to exercise its will. And in Revelation chapter 12, in that history, in Revelation 12, the dragon was manifesting itself through pagan Rome, but at the end of the world. And you'll notice this quote we're going to read. Is everybody on the back row alive for this one? Because it is for you. All right. Testimonies to Ministers, page 38. Now notice, this is during the Sunday Law time period, very plainly states. Kings and rulers and governors. What are kings, rulers, and governors? It's a group of politicians. This isn't a king. This is a group of politicians. It, what is the United Nations? It's a group of politicians. Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are rep represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith of Jesus. In their enmity against the people of God, they show themselves guilty also of the choice of Barabbas instead of Christ. Brothers and sisters, it's clear. You, if you take the time, you can show that the dragon power is represented by Ahab and Herod. It's a civil power, but at the end, the whole world's involved. This has to be a one-world government. And the one-world government that's here and already operating is the United Nations. And this will be a very difficult truth for Adventism to accept because when Sister White talks about this evil confederacy, and that's her words, evil confederacy, she talks about this evil confederacy many, many times. She describes um, this evil confederacy in several pages, but if you turn to Isaiah 8, this isn't in your notes, it says, associate yourself, Isaiah 8, 9. Associate yourself, O you people, and you shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all ye are of far countries. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and you shall be broken in pieces. Verse 10 of Isaiah 8. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord thus spake, with, spake to me with a strong hand and instructed me, that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. If you take those verses, Isaiah 8, 9 through 14, and you type them into the Ellen White CD-ROM, Sister White says this is a worldwide confederacy at the end of time that is made up of world bankers. It's made up of Freemasons. That's her words, Masons, that has the religion uh, of spiritualism. This is the dragon power. Brothers and sisters, the United Nations is made up of world bankers and Freemasons, and it's a confederacy that encompasses the whole world. And the reason that this will be one of the most difficult things for we as Adventists to understand about Bible prophecy is what is the message here in Isaiah? Don't come in confederacy with the United Nations. Ooh. We're already in confederacy with the United Nations when we're doing our social work around the world, brothers and sisters. Yeah. That's why the world, why the warning's there. God foresaw this. He said, don't walk the way of these people. Why? Because this is the dragon power. What did it say about being denominated people? The Lord cannot be glorified in his denominated people until they are separate and peculiar. I mean, if we've got to be separate, do we have to be separate from the dragon power? I hope so. I hope so. Anyway, kings, governors, and rulers are represented as the of the dragon. The woman, of course, Jezebel in the story, when it talks about Thyatira in Revelation 2, which is the papal time period, 
that time period is symbolized by Jezebel. So that's a triple application of prophecy. That's all we're doing now. We're not really trying to lay this out. Is that one way we, we know that our message is expressed is in Revelation 18. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is what we're to tell the world. We're to tell the world about the fall of ma ba modern Babylon. And the way that we do that is we tell the world about the fall of Nimrod's Babylon and Belshazzar's Babylon. And in so doing, we've established the story of the fall of modern Babylon. And that's our message, the fourth angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's a triple application of prophecy. The third fulfillment of that prophecy, the fall of Mab modern Babylon, all the characteristics of that have been established in the first two witnesses upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. Same with Elijah. Elijah is our message. This is foundational understanding that we are the Elijah people. First Elijah, a threefold power, an impure woman, a civil power, a deceiving power. Second Elijah, same story, identical story. But we know at the end of the world, we have to deal with the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Whoever the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet are, based upon Elijah, one of them is going to be an impure church, one of them is going to be a worldwide civil power, and another one's going to be a power that forces the whole world to accept the arrangement. They're all here. They're all here. That's triple application of prophecy. Here's another triple application of prophecy on page 172. Three Romes. When you take the characteristics of pagan Rome and combine it with the characteristics of papal Rome, you will establish the characteristics of modern Rome. Okay? Now, you know, this is all I'm doing, brothers and sisters. All I'm doing here is trying to show you this rule. There, I'm leaving out much of the important information connected to each of these um, illustrations. But look on your page. Was pagan Rome a persecuting power? Was papal Rome a persecuting power? Will modern Rome be a persecuting power? Was pagan Rome a desolating power? Was papal Rome a desolating power? Modern Rome will be a desolating power. What was the title of the head of pagan Rome? What, was the, what is the title of papal Rome? The head, Pontifus Maximus. What's going to be the title of the head of modern Rome? Pontifus Maximus. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. What's the religion of pagan Rome? Paganism. What's the religion of papal Rome? Paganism. What's the religion of modern Rome? Paganism, doesn't it, doesn't it rub you raw that we it's standard operating procedure in the world today to, to call Catholicism Christianity? It's paganism. It's paganism. From beginning to end, with, uh, with wearing a Christian profession that you can't justify it by the Bible, nowhere close to being Christian. Uh, pagan Rome worshiped the sun. Papal Rome worshiped the sun. What is it that modern Rome worships? If you don't understand that, in the very near future you were, will. At the Sunday law. Uh, pagan Rome fulfilled the abomination of desolation in the AD 70 time period. Papal Rome fulfilled the abomination of desolation in the Dark Ages, and modern Rome is going to fulfill the abomination of desolation when? The Sunday law. And the first part of that took place when? At the first Sunday law, 1888, at the Blair Bill. But when you take, this is one where you need to spend some time. When you take the characteristics of the first fulfillment of the abomination of desolation and the characteristics of the second fulfillment of the abomination of desolation during the 1260 years, you have established the characteristics of the third fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. So those two testimonies of pagan Rome and papal Rome in connection with the abomination of desolations, one of the things they teach is that the abomination of desolation comes and places itself in a place where it should not ought be. I know that Matthew 24 says the holy place but Luke, place, Luke or Mark, Mark says in a place where it ought not. And in 1888, Sunday legislation was in the Congress of the United States in the, in the sacred precincts of what makes the United States strong. What makes the United States strong prophetically? The Constitution. It was there. But in AD 70 time period, pagan Rome, and this is Sister White's wor words, not mine, Pagan, the armies of pagan Rome, here's their words, mysteriously withdrew. They backed off. And in 1888, when the Sunday law came at the Blair Bill, that attempt to bring in a Sunday law was mysteriously withdrawn. But you know what? That was the sign to get out of the cities. 1888. When Rome returns, everyone in the city dies. That's what the three abominations of desolations teaches. 
And, it, and the only reason, you know, it was maybe been three years in the pagan Rome in AD 70 time period, they had two or three years. And we've had a hundred and some years. But Sister White says all of God's prophecies need to be understood in connection with his long suffering and mercy. But brothers and sisters, we're getting to, to the time period where the Bible says it like this, mercy is about to take her flight. So pagan Rome represents churchcraft. In the, in the history of pagan Rome, this is where we get the threefold branch of government that still exists in the world today that is here in the United States, where papal Rome represents churchcraft. Modern Rome is, is identifying the combination of church and state at the end of the world. Uh, there's, a pagan, there's a time prophecy on how long pagan Rome would rule the world. Daniel 11:24 would rule the world supremely for 360 years. There's a time prophecy on how long papal Rome would rule the world, 1260 years. There is no time prophecy on how long modern Rome would rule the world because time prophecy came to an end in 1844. But there is still lessons to learn in connection with that because it was not until pagan Rome conquered the third geographical obstacle in fulfillment of Daniel 8:9 and Daniel 11:16 and 17. And it had to overcome Syria. Israel and Egypt and when it overcome Egypt at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC it ruled the world supremely for 360 years Papal Rome did not rule the world supremely until the third horn was removed the Goths in March Was it March? 538 and then they ruled for 1260 years So modern Rome when you come to Daniel 11 40 to 45 and you see the king of the south followed by the glorious land and Egypt, those are the three obstacles for modern Rome. And when Egypt is conquered, the deadly wound is healed. So there is a lesson, even though there is no time prophecy for modern Rome. Um, pagan Rome ruled su supremely from the city of Rome. Papal Rome ruled supremely from the city of Rome. Modern Rome, the papacy today, is still going to be ruling from the city of Rome when it is burned with fire and its flesh is eaten. Um, Pagan Rome counterfeits Jerusalem. Papal Rome counterfeits Jerusalem. Modern Rome is a counterfeit Jerusalem. So, once you see this triple application of prophecy in connection with Rome, and you go back to the 1843 chart, and you realize that Sister White and in, in the Bible have endorsed the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, and how do I say the, pioneer, the Bible endorses the pioneer understanding? Brothers and sisters, all the prophets were speaking more about the end of the world than the days in which they lived. And the theme of all the Bible prophets is seek ye for the old paths. The message for God's people at the end of the world is that you need to make sure what your foundations are because the foundations are identifying what the capstone is going to be. All right, we looked at a little bit of that about Zerubbabel yesterday. Zerubbabel laid the foundation. He's going to lay the capstone. Zerubbabel means what? Out of Babylon. The foundation was laid in Adventism at the second angel's message, which was a call out of Babylon. The capstone is laid at the fourth angel's message, which is a call out of Babylon. All right? If you're going to, if you're going to, you can take the Bible alone and see that the Bible endorses the foundations that the Millerites established. And those foundations were that the seven trumpets of Revelation were the historical forces that brought to a demise Rome. The first four trumpets brought Western Rome to a conclusion by the year 476. After 476, there was no more an, an Italian that ruled Western Rome from the city of Rome. The barbarians had come in, the first four trumpets. Odiacer, Attila the Hun, Genseric out of northern Africa, and Alaric. The first four trumpets, they bring to a conclusion Western Rome. The next two trumpets that are illustrated here on this chart is Islam. In fact, the first four trumpets are trumpets, and the last three trumpets are trumpets, but the last three trumpets are also called woes. And the fifth and sixth trumpet are the first and second woes. And the woes are a triple application of prophecy. And brothers and sisters, this is one, once you see it, and you see it, you see it set forth here on the 1843 chart. This isn't an accident because here you see the pioneer understanding of the first and second woe illustrated right here. So what was the pioneer understanding of the first and second woe? Because if you understand what the characteristics of the first woe are and the second woe, and you take those characteristics together, what have you established? The characteristics of the third woe. Okay, the first woe, and if you have the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, you go read it. I'm not stretching anything. This is a simple overview that he establishes in that book, which is the pioneer position 
of what the first woe was. It was Islam. This is the, the, the human person that's associated with the fifth trumpet, the first woe is Muhammad. This is when Muhammad comes into history and the religion of Islam begins. Islam in the first woe was going to war against the armies of Rome, pioneer position. And not only, was it, not only is this established in the, the fifth trumpet first woe, and not only did the pioneers understand it, that they were going to attack the armies of, war, of Rome, the, the mode of warfare is even represented in the fifth trumpet, and the pioneers understood it. What was the mode of warfare for Islam in the first woe? They strike suddenly and unexpectedly. They were riding the, the uh, Ara Arabian horses. The Romans are sitting down here in the valley, and all of a sudden the Arabian horses come over the sand dunes and cut them up with swords, and before the blood's running, they're gone over the other sand dune. That's, that's what's illustrated in the fifth trumpet, and that's what's identified by the pioneers. Not only that they would war against the armies of Rome, but their mode of warfare was that they would strike suddenly and unexpectedly. Their power was in their tails. And Isaiah 9.15 tells us um, that their tails is the prophet that teaches lies. Hmm. So they're being directed by not just Muhammad, but the prophets. They're what they would call now their imams is what they call them today. That's the ones that are motivating them from behind the scenes back in the first woe time period. Now the second woe, the sixth trumpet, illustrated up here on this, this chart, which was directed by the hand of the Lord and that the figures should not be altered, the second woe was also Islam. The first woe was going to torment the armies of Rome, but the second woe was going to kill the armies of Rome. And the, all the trumpets were the historical forces that brought down Rome. And in the first four trumpets, Western Rome was brought to a conclusion. And in the fifth and sixth trumpet, the first and second woe, woe Eastern Rome was brought to a conclusion, and so was Papal Rome. The trumpets are nothing more than the historical forces that bring down Rome. The first four trumpets bring down Western Rome. The next two trumpets bring down Eastern Rome and Papal Rome. And the seventh trumpet, what will it bring down? Modern Rome. How hard is that one? Okay. So the second, the second woe, the sixth trumpet, was also Islam. It's Islam now has moved to Turkey. The first, the first woe was Islam in Arabia. The second woe is Islam that has migrated into Turkey, become established there. Their mode of warfare against the armies of Rome. They're still fighting the armies of Rome. Their mode of war warfare is that they strike suddenly and unexpectedly, except for one thing. In this history, gunpowder is invented. So they strike suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. All right, you add that together with the first. Whoa, and you've got the characteristics of their warfare. They're also directed by their heads and the tails, by the imams. They're the providential forces that bring down Rome. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a triple application prophecy. When the third woe arrives in history, based upon this biblical rule that upon the testimony of two a thing is established, when the third woe arrives in history, you, you should expect to see Islam striking suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives against the armies of Rome. Who's the armies of Rome at the end of the world? If you ever reach a time where you see radical Islam suddenly and unexpectedly strike the armies of Rome, you know you've reached a time period called the third woe, which leads right into the second coming of Christ. You think that'll ever happen? Brothers and sisters, 9-11 was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The woe is underway, and the woe is the power that torments and brings to a conclusion modern Rome. Seventh-day Adventists are sleeping on, okay? They're sleeping on. I, I, I can't help that. They're sleeping on. The only purpose that you and I are in the world today is to give the fourth angel's message, which is two parts, a clarification of what Rome is, verses 1 through 3 of Revelation 18, and then verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 18 is a call out of Babylon. Our job is to define what Babylon is and call people out of Babylon, and we're not even sure what Babylon is. We don't even, we're not sure if it's the United States, the United Nations, and the papacy. But we're, while we're sitting back in our land to see in condition being unsure of what it is, the providential force that's going to bring Babylon down is already in the world doing its work. I mean, we're, we're at the very end. 
Rome's already on its way down. The forces that are going to bring it down are already active. I'm not saying that it's, they're still not going to rise up and get more controlling and aggressive, but I'm saying we're right at the end of the world. And you know what? You know what, brothers and sisters? This particular truth, this is a truth. When you, when you go to look at the three woes in depth, I, we didn't look at it in depth. I mean, you go back to the, the, the grandfather of Islam. Who's the grandfather of Islam? I know, go back, that, that's a grandfather. Let's go back to the great-grandfather, Ishmael. Okay, Ishmael. What's the Bible say about Ishmael? Number one, it says this. He was the father of how many princes? Twelve. Twelve. What's the twelve in Bible prophecy? It's a number associated with God's kingdom. I mean, anyway, you look at it, the, the twelve descendants of Jacob, the twelve disciples, the twelve foundations to the city, twelve is a number associated with God's kingdom. Islam Ishmael's descendants have a specific role in Bible prophecy, and as you trace it down through the years, you see that Ishmael's descendants were used to bring chastisement against God's people and protect God's people. They have a dual role. Brothers and sisters, it was Islam that prevented the papacy from sweeping around the world. In the time period of the first and second woe, they swept around Europe, took control of northern Africa, or made it up into Portugal and Spain and prevented Catholicism from going that way, and they wrapped up around the Asiatic side, and they controlled the papacy from spreading. They are the ones that pre preserved the received texts of the Bible. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have God's word. All we'd have is the Catholic Bibles that are out there. Islam was the providential force that protected the received text, God's word. Uh, if you read the writings of Martin Luther, when he was starting his work in the Protestant Reformation, every time he was um, being threatened by the papacy, what happened? Islam came down out of the north, and the armies that were coming against Luther and his fathers would have fo followers would be pulled off to protect against Islam. And Martin Luther stated publicly in his writings that it was Islam that was the deliverer of the Protestant Reformation. That's my words, but that's what he was saying. That's a paraphrase. They were used by God to protect, yet bring chastisement. They're connected to God's kingdom. I mean, when Joseph got sent to Egypt, when he got sent to Egypt, how was he protected? His, his brothers wanted to kill him, right? The Ishmaelite traders show up, and they take him into Egypt over and over again. You see that Ishmael has a du and his descendants have a dual role in Bible prophecy. But what, once you nail down that the number 12 is associated with Ishmael and its descendants, and you understand that it has a connection with the kingdom of God, and you realize that Jacob's 12 sons all have a prophecy about how they will be impact the end of the world, you're familiar with the blessings that were placed upon Jacob's 12 sons, then you ask yourself, well, does Ishmael have an end of the world prophecy connected with him? And we all know what it is. Genesis 14, 12, is it? 16, 12. Yes, there you go. What's it say about Ishmael? He's going to be a wild and crazy man. Now, brothers and sisters, how wild and crazy is it to walk into a room full of people with a bomb strapped on and set it off? His hand's going to be against every man, and every man's hand's going to be against him. Brothers and sisters, Bible prophecy is clear that the, the issue that brings every man's hand in the world together is Islam, the descendants of Ishmael. How do they do it? What's going on today, brothers and sisters, it's only going to escalate further. Radical Islam is on its way of br to bringing the world to its knees. It's going to torment. That's the first woe. It's going to torment the armies of Rome. It's going to bring a situation here in this country that brings about what? The Sunday law. And after that, the United States goes out to the whole world and says we must bring the world under the umbrella of a one world government in order to deal with radical Islam. And you know what the world's going to say? There is no way that we will come under the control of someone like George Bush. We don't trust him, and the world doesn't. And the rest of the world's going to say, there's no way we're going to bow down to the United Nations because they're just a bunch of political crooks. But we do have faith and confidence in the Pope of Rome. And in 533, the emperor of the Roman Empire, in a political crisis when the Roman Empire was falling apart, he entered into a religious crisis and identified the Church of Rome above 
the, the church in Constantinople. And in 533, the Emperor Justinian gave his civil authority to the papacy. It's a historical fact, and that's what the pioneers believed. And at the end of the world, the civil authority, the United Nations, according to Revelation 17, the ten kings agree to give their kingdom unto the papacy. Why? Because the world's falling apart because of radical Islam and because there's a religious crisis going on in the world. And what's the religious crisis? The religious crisis is, can we trust all of Islam or do we have to deal with radical Islam and, and leave you know, conservative Islam alone and the United States can't decide, the United Nations can't decide, we'll let the papacy decide. We'll agree to a one world government, but only if Papa is the one that is the moral authority. And as soon as he's in his seat, the deception comes, comes about. I want John the Baptist's head in a charger. That's what just ahead. It's already being worked out in the world. The arguments are already here. This is our message, brothers and sisters. This is our message. It's easy to show from Bible prophecy. We're just scraping the arguments on the, the three woes and the three Romes and the three Elijahs. Why? Because we want you to see that these arguments are endorsed by this chart that Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord because everything that we just said about the woes is in agreement with the pioneer's understanding of the first and second woe. And upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. And I submit to you, those of you that have set through these presentations, that every aspect of that chart has a bearing on what's going on in the world here today. Amen. In the Millerite time period, when this chart became present truth, the vision was going to be fulfilled. It's now becoming present truth. How is it in your life? Are you ready for the Sunday law test? Do you have a character prepared for the seal of God? Does your wife or your husband or your children or your neighbor? Brothers and sisters, time is running out. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light you've given us, but we also recognize that if it is truly light, if we go home and we test these things by your word and through prayer, and if what we're seeing in these things is truly so, then times are much more serious than we were thinking they were maybe a week ago. And we must change the direction of our lives that we can be in a position to where you can use us not only because if we don't, people's blood will be upon our garments, but because we have loved ones that we don't want to live in eternity without that need to be awakened. Heavenly Father, we need to be awakened and so full of your spirit that your love constrains us to be about our business of giving this final warning message and I thank you for the light that you left recorded in this simple little chart from that short little time period from 1840 to 44. I thank you for the simple endorsements that were given about this chart from your servant, Ellen White. And I ask that you'd give us the wisdom to see how important these foundational truths are here at the end of the world. And thank you for blessing these meetings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.